Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Inside Out Alignment Show. My name is Mike. Today is episode nine. And today we have with us Gordon Perry. Gordon, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. So I start every uh, interview this way with a simple question. Tell us who you are. I'm a practitioner who has a keen interest in um, human potential. And so I would say in layman's terms, in the context of what we're talking about today, you're an executive coach who is more than that, by the way, that's a disservice because I've worked with numerous coaches in the past. Uh, I think everybody was here and, and then you are kind of off the charts in terms of how you actually apply um, what you know and what you recommend people do. Barry, we're talking about this a lot, practitioner, being a practitioner. So much of what I learned from you, I was able actually to put into, into place in my daily life. So that was awesome. Well, and that's very kind. Those are very, very kind words um, to hear from you. But that is our intention. Our intention um, and the firm that um, I co-founded with Helen Kane is designed to take um, somewhat um, theoretical constructs, sometimes academic teachings, and distill them in a way that people can understand them and apply them. And human beings are complex. Human systems are even more complex. And um, and yet, within all that complexity, there actually is some simplicity, and that's actually what we strive to do. And and we do it, I guess, I think about our work is, um, my background is in organizations, so I'm trained in business uh, with, a, with training in psychology. And um, so that's where we apply it. We apply it in organizational settings. That's great. And we're going to get into some much more detail. But before we get started... Subscribe to this channel, smash that like button, and share this video with your friends. And so we did have a pre-call, and we kind of bucketed a bunch of ideas. And where we landed is on this theme of intentionality, being very intentional with what it is that you're doing. And so one of the first things that we wanted to talk about is this idea of authenticity, You know, the importance of knowing who we are, how we operate, how we process information, how we interact with people. So tell us a little bit about two things. One, what intentionality means to you? And then let's transition into authenticity and why that matters. Yeah, it's interesting, Mike. I was thinking about our conversation today, and I, I, one of the ways that got triggered was we were talking about this idea of how you can care deeply and passionately about things and also let go of particular outcomes. And that's how we started to talk about all of this yeah. and then it evolved into the topics that, that we're discussing. Um, in terms of authenticity and intentionality, I mean, the name of our firm, and we chose the name, is Authentic impact. And those words are very purposeful. Um, and so the authentic, authenticity piece of it is um, we bring a variety of tools and resources to help our clients know themselves. And each of us is uniquely different. Um, we share a lot of similarities with other human beings, but each of us is is unique. And our, our gifts and our ability to contribute is also unique. So when we start working with a client, one of the first things we do is we use a variety of tools so they can help to get to, so we can get to know them, right? So we can be most helpful, but also so they have some language um, and um, more tangible constructs of who they are at their, at their very best. Um, and then what we do is we direct it. So the intentionality piece is, well, what kind of impact do I want to have? Um, and all of us have different goals and objectives we're trying to achieve. And so that's really what our work is, is from an authentic place, how can you accomplish what needs to be accomplished so that you can achieve some of those impacts that you'd like to have in the world? And what I thought was really cool when we went through the exercise in our interaction is once that information was presented back to me, one thing that you said is, Mike, you don't have to apologize for who you are. You just have to make people aware, right? And so I'm a I'm a data hound. I ask a lot of questions. And like one of the most empowering action steps, right? Practical. This is all about how do you make this practical? Like you gave me permission. And that's a big theme in my life is sometimes I've not given myself enough permission. And so as you interact with people and you kind of become a little more self-aware, you just find yourself being able to give yourself permission. And so I started having these very upfront conversations, very respectful. Hey, just so you know, first time meeting people, a client, I am very service oriented. I ask a lot of questions. I am curious as an understatement. I have a desire to learn uh, that's insatiable. So you'll find I ask a lot of questions. It's not anything to do with you. It's how I operate. So I just want you to know that. And everybody was like, that's awesome. I'm the same way. Or, oh, you know what? I get that. But there was this, this bridge, right? There was, and it was like, like that for me was 
one of the biggest light bulb moments. So can you just talk about how, you know, when you figure out or find out how you are, what is authentically you, how empowering that can be for people? Yes. It, um, well, for them, for, for one thing to start with, I guess, is that, um, you know, there's a saying that fish discover water last, right? And that the idea there is that they're so used to it. It's their environment. They don't think about it, right? That's who we largely are as individuals too, who we are and who we become over time. Um, it happens slowly and it's natural to us. And so we don't really pay that much attention um, to it. And then what we can do, because it things that come easy for us and the way we think about things and how we operate in the world, um, it doesn't seem that special to us because it's just who we are and what we do. Um, so one of the things about really understanding ourselves is, is to to truly kind of be able to name and claim, this is using Gallup language. They use this language around talents, ab the ability to name them, claim them and aim them. And um, that's, you know, that's part of authenticity is understanding and owning who we are. And um, we use strength-based tools. Um, we find that people get more value if we start from a place of understanding what their strengths are. Um, and, and in reality, what we find is that, that people don't fully deploy their strengths. Um, and part of that is because they take them for granted. They don't really know how to aim them um, appropriately. The other thing is, is we don't ignore weaknesses. So all of us have weaknesses. And but but if we can come to a true understanding of our strengths, we start to understand right away where maybe overusing strengths can get us into trouble and it also allows us to be a little bit more open to, I don't have to be everything to everybody. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to contribute in the way that somebody else does. So it opens people up, I think, to a more realistic way of operating in the world. And, and the other thing too is people respond very well to authenticity. So we know that followers, right? When you interview followers, um, when they look at the characteristic that's most important to them in a leader, uh, what what do you think it is? Relatability and trust and being authentic. Yes, it's it's that honesty and authenticity. And so Kuz and Posner, who study leadership, and they've done it for decades in all different cultures, find a very consistent finding. The number one trait that followers look for is somebody who is honest and authentic. And what, what I find really fascinating about that, it, it, it strips out um, competency and vision by more than 15 percentage points. So I don't even have to be that bright. As long, as long as I'm honest and authentic. And I think I, I can speak personally. I mean, I, and I talked uh, with Wade Allen in my, my last podcast, like I, I am drawn and, and think about what's happened the last three years, like how much uncertainty has gone on in our lives. And so what are we striving for? It's that familiarity, trust, like trust is a theme, like who, what can I trust? And it's like a moth to light. You just, you gravitate that way. So everything you're saying resonates with, with how I see it. It's so interesting. When you talk about the most recent years, one thing that stands out to me, and it fits very well with our topic, is um, uh, the last few years provided opportunities for people to challenge their thinking. And, and truly, I think um, a key to navigating the last few years, at least for me personally and for, for some people that I know, was this ability to um, actually operate within paradoxical thinking. How could two things both be true? Right. And what what we tend to do is we tend to get um, banked on one side of the river um, as opposed to flowing down through it. And then that's where this ability to to pause, get much more comfortable um, with paradoxical concepts can really serve us well. So that's a great segue, because that is literally the next topic we're going to talk about is the power of paradox. And I, and I wrote some notes here as I was preparing for this. And, you know, the initial idea we were talking about is this idea of letting go of attachment, detach from outcome, right? Letting go, um, polarity, right? And then and, and, and how this duality, things in life, have you heard the quote, there's a... Um, there are no truths, there are only half truths, or all truths are half truths. And, you know, you can interpret that seven ways to Sunday, but let's drill down a little bit, right? So we we have some definitions of what paradox is. Um, and then we have some people that have used and, and encouraged people to embrace paradox, like Niels Bohr and even Einstein. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what is paradox in, in the context of being a better version of ourselves as we navigate our day? And then talk a little bit about some of the folks who've used it in their work. So I think with um, paradox is that 
Um, and Niels Bohr has a, there's a quote that's attributed to him and he, he won the Nobel prize for his work in, um, in atomic theory. And, and, but one of the things he said is how lucky we are, and I'm paraphrasing this incorrectly, but basically how lucky we are that we find ourselves with a paradox, we finally can start to make progress. And so that inspired, it inspires me when I bounce up to something that seems paradoxical and it's very difficult to solve, it inspires me to, to pause and look at it and, and look for how could two seemingly opposing things both be true. And when, when we do that, we, we, we keep ourselves open to more information, more knowledge. Um, and when we look at how wisdom is formed and there's a brain basis for how wisdom is formed, it, it, it makes perfect sense why paradox is so powerful because um, as knowledge gets finished into wisdom within the brain, there's something happening within dendrites. And Marion Diamond was one of the first neuroscientists to speak about neurogenesis. Um, she was actually one of the first female neuroscientists. When she spoke on stage about neurogenesis, people laughed in the audience, but she discovered um, our, the brain's ability to form connections. And one of the part of her work was looking at wisdom and wisdom is this, this thing that happens in the brain with the sixth dendrite. It's a, we have these dendrites that connect. The sixth one is really powerful because it reaches across. Well, sometimes when we're in confusion or we're dealing with things that are paradoxical, it's uncomfortable. We like certainty. We like knowing things. Um, but what we can do then is we can stunt our, our development and our growth. And um, so anyway, what, where, that, where I, when I think about the power of paradox, um, it's this opportunity to get comfortable with discomfort. Yeah. The ability to um, uh, stay open to multiple possibilities. So I wanna, so I'm hearing you say that and something comes to mind, growth set versus fixed mindset. Don't you find in that, in those moments when we are uncomfortable, when, like you said, there's this duality going on, there's a paradox for us to consider, right? Just to consider and stay with and, and, and thinking of two people, one that has a fixed mindset and one who has a growth mindset. So what do you think the fixed mindset does? I don't like this. I drop it. And then you, you stunt whatever could have bloomed versus someone who chooses to have a growth mindset that just happens to know I'm the type of person who, and stays with that discomfort right? Really right. stays with the comfort and unpacks what's going on. And a lot of this is self-awareness. We can talk about resilience, self-control, but speak a little bit about growth minds as it relates to these paradox. And, and they're all related. I mean, so there's constructs in resiliency um, that are related to the growth mindset. And, um, and then back to knowing ourselves, right? The assessments that we took you through um, and I looked it up, Mike, um, I didn't realize we did that work 11 years ago. Uh, the document that we did it on, we used to put it on a little PowerPoint. And so <laughs> I, I thought, when did Mike and I do his, right? And I looked yeah. it up. And, uh, anyway, it, it's, it was in the very early stages of, of our work. Okay, but how we're wired also contributes to this. So people that have a more structural um, way of thinking, um, they may have an action mode that's more data oriented, they may have a value around diligence, those things can all combine and they can make kind of this openness a little bit harder, right? There's other ends of the spectrum where we can get it kind of wired too far the other way, um, where we think anything is possible. So it's, it's um, this growth mindset um, versus fixed mindset resiliency, it's largely around um, being able to hold that multiple things can be true. And in our desire for certainty, we often shortcut the process. Um, and because uh, learning is sometimes painful, um, we run the risk uh, backing away from the learning just when if we would have stayed with it, um, we could have seen something really great happen. So in more practical terms, what I suggest to people is one, pay attention to when you are certain about something, because as soon as you are certain about something, there's a really good invitation to just pause and you can, you can articulate what you believe to be true with great certainty. But then what I did challenge you to do is say, and what else is possible? 
For some people, that's really hard. So I say, what you could say instead is, and what else might be possible right. is just leaving enough openness there. Because when we do that and we start to look for what else could be possible, that's when we leave the door open for this more finished form of knowledge. And, you know, Marion Diamond uh, is interesting. And if you're, if her name grabs your attention, she's got a fascinating YouTube video on Stanford's um, channel where she, you get to see one of her lectures. She, one thing about Marion Diamond that's really interesting as well is that she studied Einstein's brain. Wow. So she actually had a slice of Einstein's brain. And there's a quote attributed to Einstein right? Where he said, he's not that much smarter than anybody. He just sticks with problems longer. Yeah, exactly. Well, his brain, when they took a sample slice of his brain, he was in fact telling the truth. His <laughs> helial cells, right? That, that indicate this six dendrite work of, of wisdom were far more pronounced in his brain than they are in the average brain. So basically he, he was open. I know he was open to paradox. He studied things. He stuck with things longer. He he didn't get uncomfortable in the valley of confusion. He continued through it um, so that he could hit kind of that next hill of wisdom. And then maybe taking things in a more practical sense and then interpersonal, right? I feel like um, benefit of the doubt, um, yes. positive intent. I heard it said most generous intention. Like how can I simply in this dynamic with another individual, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. What else could this mean? I think Tony Robbins always says it. What else could this mean? You know, you're certain of something, but what else could it mean? So I think it speaks to what you're talking about there. Definitely, definitely does. And, and like on interpersonal relationships, we often, you know, trust is so important. And when we have a foundation of trust, we can actually be more of our authentic self. We have much more effective conversations. And then it's kind of a cyclical process. The, the, the more we have effective conversations with other people, say what we really mean, hear what they really have to say, it builds the trust. So we always tell people a shortcut to building that trust is assume positive intent. If somebody does something and you ascribe ill intent to it, just do the, kind of the same thing you did with paradoxes. I believe this is what's happening. And what else might be possible? If I assume positive intent, what else might be possible? And that oftentimes is just, just the little bit that you need to, to, to build it. So the last thing, or one of the last things I wanted to talk about today is this idea of being a daily practitioner, right? So all of this theory, all of this knowledge, if it's not, if there's no action that follows it up and consistency of action, then, you know, we're talking about wisdom. So unapplied knowledge does, has zero chance to become wisdom. So talk about how important it is to, to be a practitioner of new information, I guess is maybe the best way to frame it. So, you know, we're, we often live in autopilot. We kind of, we're just going through the motions that kind of talks about intentionality, right? The opposite of autopilot is intentionality. So now we know this, we have this new information about ourselves and how we operate. So it's really important that we start taking the daily action. So talk about the practitioner side of all of this. In, in adult development, there's all kinds of graduate degrees you can get that are related to adult learning and adult development. And it's complex and human beings are complex. And actually it's all very simple too. So when we describe our work with people, um, I mean, we can go down any kind of, as you can tell already in the conversation, we can go down all kinds of paths, but if you were to distill it, um, human beings develop and they grow through a series of insight and action. And so when we work in one-on-one -on -one executive development, um, um, and oftentimes the term executive coaching is applied, the reason executive coaching is applied because there's, there's particular aspects of that form of development. But, but in, in essence, what you're doing there is our role as a coach is to help to have the client achieve insights and then take action on those insights. When we do group facilitations, um, we always end our group facilitations with an insight and an action section. And, and the way we even frame it is if you just took one action, what would you take? So we don't tell people build this comprehensive plan and then go back. No, we know from our experience, if you, if you pause and you gain insight and you choose to take a single action and you just keep doing that on a regular basis, incredible things happen. This thing about like practitioner and doing something with it. Most of our coaching engagements, it's six hours of time, six hours. And it, it, we spread it over a six month time period. And I always work, we always work with coaches in the beginning to say, you know, what are your goals? What do you most want to achieve? And we use language, like if anything was possible, what would you most like to achieve? And if I feel like the client is, is um, aiming to 
to low or narrow. Um, so that's great. We can do that. But what else? Would, I mean, what would you, if you could make anything different, what would you like to be different? And the reason I do we do that is because we've seen it happen time and time and time again that over a disciplined process of six months of insight and taking action, um, really incredible things happen for people. So I think about, you know, all truths are half truths, right? And so why would you not want to think big if that could also be true? Like, and I think, you know, this idea we we become what we think about, you know, our self-image, we're the type of person who, and so I think all of this just starts on the inside, the way that we have a, vi a vision of ourselves, our self-image, our identity, the type of person who, all of this really matters. But I also wanted to touch base on a really quick transition to why people may, despite knowing better, get stuck. And the idea of fear kind of comes in here a little bit. So can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, and it's why I'm just so fascinated and, and I don't ever really envision myself fully retiring because there's so much to learn. And every day, every day I learn it. And I often tell my uh, clients that I get the opportunity to work with that it's the most wonderful thing because you get something out of it. And I never leave a coaching engagement without greater knowledge or learning something from it. Um, okay. So, but, and, and therein lies some of this answer. Human beings are incredible. We're, we're incredibly adaptable. Um, we can achieve far more than we actually tend to think we can achieve. Um, and there are some imperfections in how we are designed and how we operate. Um, and so a few of those things that get in people's way, why don't they do something? Why don't they aim high? Um, well, there are some common fears. Dan Baker, in a book that he wrote many years ago called What Happy People Know, he articulated the two most common fears. And, and he discovered these in his work at Canyon Ranch. He developed a, a, a program many years ago that that really attributed to people that had lots of resources. You think their life would be wonderful, but they would come to Canyon Ranch because they were really struggling. Anyway, through his work and his work as a psychologist, what he found that the two most common fears that people carry with them are the fear of not being enough and the fear of not having enough. Mm. And so those are two fears that get in our way. And um, then there's other things. We have a, um, a negativity bias in general. So we pay more attention to and we remember um, the bad things in life, then we do the good things. Um, and so sometimes people are fearful about proceeding because they're, they've told some stories to themselves or other people have told them stories that they now believe yeah. that I could never, I could never imagine to do that because of this, this, and that. So there's a, there's a lot of, um, fear, I think that gets in the way. And then, then there is a very true, based on what people have experienced to date in life, there is the reality of something that Martin Seligman discovered early in his research called learned helplessness mm. and learned helplessness is a phenomenon. When we try to achieve something and, and then we fail, we try again and we fail. There's a risk that we can teach ourselves helplessness. Um, and, and, and the, by the way, if people don't take anything else from this podcast, the power of the word and is a really good thing. It is. Okay. And, and learned optimism. So Martin Seligman went on to discover that in the same way as human beings, we can learn helplessness, we can also learn optimism. Um, but yes, those are quickly, there's many more, but those are a few reasons why um, sometimes we as human beings um, aim lower um, than yeah. we should. Yeah, predictability, certainty, subconscious survival, all of that is kind of rooted in there. So, um, so great. So much knowledge and so much insights. So as we're finishing up, please subscribe to this channel, like the video, share it with your friends. Gordon, thanks so much for today. This is always enjoyable. And I, I think I say this every time we talk, I leave more stoked and excited and motivated after our conversations because like you, I get so much out of these conversations and I feel that's a blessing. So let's end on this note, um, high level, big picture as you've worked in the industry, as long as you have, and you've seen as many clients as you have, is there a common thread of insight suggestions you can share with folks as they're trying to become a better version of themselves? Are there common themes, aha moments that really resonate? 
there's there's probably many, but what what comes to mind is the importance of pausing. So taking time to pause, um, then taking time to reflect and discern, and then taking action. And it's it's doing all three of those, and then and being being careful at each step of the way. <laughs> that, I mean, sometimes people get all caught up in discernment, and discernment without action won't really get us anywhere. Action without discernment gets us all kinds of places we may want not want to be. So, yeah, I would just say that that would probably apply to all of my work, e even from when I was in corporations myself, working in organizations would be pause and kind of pause and breathe. Yeah. Just, and then take action and just keep doing it every day, show up, pause, discern, take action. And when you add all that together, um, you're going to be able to have a contribution in the world that's far greater than you could have imagined. That's awesome. And I think it brings us back full circle to starting with intentionality, like being intentional and authentic instead of autopilot and just going through the motions. I think it all ties it together. So that's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Gordon. It was a pleasure. So if anyone has an interest in reaching out to you and your company, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Oh, probably just to Google our website. It's it's three words, myauthenticimpact.com. And um, that brings you to our website and you can learn a little bit about our work and um, our contact information is there. So great. Gordon, thanks so much for the time. I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. All right. Bye, Gordon. Bye.